Let's turn to page 59. Step 10. Continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Okay, let's move to uh, page 84, where step 10 begins. We're going to go to page 84, paragraph 2. That's page 84, paragraph 2. Where the authors say, this thought brings us to step 10 which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. So if I'm actively making my amends, this is what I will experience. I will have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. What I find beautiful about about this paragraph is that the author has given me specific instructions on how to do a daily 10 step. If you look back at the beginning of this paragraph, it says, we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. No mention of at the end of the day when I retire, but as I go along. In other words, a 10 step is something I'm going to practice during the day. And the authors give us specific instructions here. They show us how to, how to carry out four spiritual practices. The first one is watch. If you go down, go down eight lines in that paragraph, it says continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Have you ever been to the mall and people watch? Or go to the park and you people watch. You don't interact with those people. You simply observe. That's what watching means. If you want to have a new experience, try practicing watching for a mere 30 days. Simply watch you. That doesn't mean I analyze what I do. I'm just simply observing. So I'm watching for four things. And then the authors instruct me what to do when this occurs. It says, when these crop up, We ask, that's a prayer. We ask God at once to remove them. So if they crop up at once, I'm going to ask God to remove them. Immediately following, it says we discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. That means I'm going to discuss it with somebody that day before I go to bed. And it also says, and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. So you see, I have this spot check that I... Inventory I can do during the day where I can make amends immediately. Then it goes on to say, then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. So isn't that beautiful? We have four we have four spiritual practices that we can do during the day: watch, ask, discuss, and turn. Now what we have in the next paragraph are called the ten step promises. Now this is providing that I've done everything up to this point. Meaning, I've had a first step experience. I found a power greater than me. I made a decision to give my life to that God. I did an inventory, shared it with another person, took the exact nature of my wrongs to God in six and seven, compiled my harmless from my inventory, began making my amends, and began practicing the 10 step during the day. Check out the magnitude of these guarantees as we read on. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Wow. Would you like to be able to stop fighting anything or anyone? Does that sound cool or what? For by this time, sanity will have returned. I am guaranteed to experience what the authors experience. That has been my personal experience. I've also had the experience of not experiencing these promises when I don't do the work. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted... We recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely normally. Wow. React sanely normally. That's so foreign to me. (laughs) And when we will find that this has happened, check this out. And we will find that this has happened 
automatically. It doesn't say that I'm making it happen. We will see that our new attitude, there's that word again, new. New attitude. Not attitude, but new attitude. That means different than it was before. Poor liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. In other words, I'm not making it happen. All I'm simply doing is I'm just simply doing the footwork. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Am I in a position of neutrality? Do I feel safe and protected? We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We're neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. Then they go on to tell us that is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. They're giving us a little checklist. It has been my experience personally, as well as observing people I've worked with through the years in these rooms, that there's fundamentally only one reason why I will drink again. That's because I'm not in fit spiritual condition. If I am in fit spiritual condition, it is impossible for me to drink. My God will not let it happen. Ask yourself, well, how am I going to know if I'm fit spiritual condition? They just got through telling us. This is how we react. So I have a little checklist. Let's see if I'm in fit spiritual condition. I go back and I start reading the beginning of that paragraph. Have I ceased fighting anything or anyone? Or am I getting into arguments with people all the time? Getting into debates? Getting on a crusade? Got to convince you this is the way you got to do the program. It says, for this time, Sandy, will it has Sandy returned? Are you seldom interested in liquor and attempted? Have you been able to recoil from it as from a hot flame? Are you reacting sanely normally? It says we're not fighting it. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Now, if I am truly spiritually fit, and if I am truly in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, you know what that means? That means you cannot harm me. If I'm in a position of neutrality, saying, how are you going to hurt me? What are you going to do? Steal my truck? Go ahead. Take it. God's just going to give me another one. You want my money? Follow me. Follow me outside of the meeting, you know, where it's dark. And I go out to my truck and pull out a knife or a gun and say, I want your money. I say, okay, here. Take it. Why? Because I'm safe and protected. God's just going to give me more. I can go anywhere. I've been to places that people have told me not to go. Let's take it to the extreme. Let's say you get really resentful at me and you decide you want to kill me. Bring it on. I'm just going to a better place. <laughs> That's what being safe and protected means. It means I'm no longer living in fear. That doesn't mean I don't experience fear. I'm not driven by fear anymore. Because I, I, I've become clear as a result of following the recipe in this book that I'm a spiritual being with a human condition. Which means I'm going to have human reactions. I'm going to experience sadness, grief, anger, disappointment, so on and so forth. But that's, that's, that's natural and normal for me. Next paragraph. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest in our laurels. Here the authors are emphasizing that this is about action. We're headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How can I best serve thee? I will not mind be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. Here the authors are, are, are clearly explaining to me, to conform my will with God's is the proper use of the will. Check it out. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. What line? Thy will be done, not mine. So to conform my will with his, it says it is the proper use of the will. I'm supposed to use my will, provided I'm spiritually fit, provided that I'm having a spiritual experience, provided that I've done the the previous ten steps. So I'm supposed to use my will. We're not a bunch of automatons. 
I'm not supposed to use my brain. God gave me brains for a reason. Okay, on step 10, back there on page 84 in the second paragraph, where it says that we suggest that we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go on. Those of you that are willing to practice a daily 10th step, why don't you go ahead and recite that out loud with me? Starting with the second line in the second paragraph on page 84. So paragraph 2, second line, page 84. You ready? We, we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Congratulations. All right, we've completed step 10. So let's flip back to page 59 so that we can read step 11. Thought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Okay, back here on page 85, paragraph 2, page 85, paragraph 2. It says, much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. Notice the authors don't say that he has a lot of knowledge and power. <laughs> it says he has all knowledge and power. Now, if I have a resource available to me that has all knowledge and power, what would be the best place to go for direction? <laughs> that source. Exactly. You know what I find really ironic in these rooms? And I have had this experience so many times. The very thing that has caused me more difficulty in pain and suffering has been my own head. And you know what's really interesting about that? I get a problem. You know the first I go, place I go for a solution is my head. <laughs> now, is, is that insane or what? The thing that caused me more suffering and pain and humiliation when I came into these rooms, the old ideas, beliefs, and attitudes and perceptions that simply did not work, that is the first place I go for a solution when I have a problem. So, if I'm truly self-delusional, we read that, didn't we? Back in the second and the third step, that we are driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-pity, and self-seeking. Correct? So, if I'm truly driven by self-delusion, how am I going to know if I'm self-deluded? I'm not going to know. That's like going to a fish and asking it, what is water? The fish will say, well, you know, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> Think about the weight of that statement. If I'm self-delusional, how am I going to know if I'm self-deluded? I'm not going to know. That's why it's absolutely essential that this alcoholic maintain the strict disciplines of 10, 11, and 12. Can I rely on my interpretation, my perception of my own experience? Maybe I need other people. Maybe I need access to a God of my understanding so that I can seek this knowledge and power. Okay, then the author is going to say, if we have, it, whoa, there's that word again. If we have carefully, it doesn't say if we follow directions, if we have carefully followed directions, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. What a promise. To some extent, we have become God conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. But we must go further, and that means more action. Now, how many of you have gone to meetings and you've heard somebody speak and they picked a topic? I'd like to hear your experience with your sixth sense. It's right there in the book. I mean, the authors are telling us we have begun to develop this vital. Do you know what vital means? Essential for life. So am I going to be able to live in survival? I'm not talking about not drinking. I'm talking about living here. I'm talking about being free. Being free from my own mind, my own fears, inadequacy, self-doubts, etc., etc., etc. This vital sixth sense. So this sixth sense is absolutely essential for my life and sobriety. I'm encouraging all of you that are experiencing this vital sixth sense that you take that Back to your meetings and start talking about it. Start sharing with people your own experience with your vital sixth sense. But we must go further and that means more action. 
my 20 years of sobriety is not going to keep me spiritually fit. Now, the truth is, I don't want to do these disciplines. I would love to be able to sit home with my 20 years of sobriety and flip the old, whatchamacallit, from channel to channel and drink my Sprite and be spiritually fit. I would love to be able to do that. But that's not what my experience shows me. Am I willing to do the disciplines? Yes. Why do I do them? A couple of reasons. Not because I'm a truth seeker. There are no truth seekers in Alcoholics Anonymous. We're comfort seekers. That's why I maintain the disciplines. Because I enjoy the comfort, the peace of mind, the serenity, the freedom, the reprieve from alcohol. Being in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. That's why I do the disciplines on a regular basis. Not because I want to do them. It's because I enjoy feeling comfort. And that's what these disciplines do for me. Let's read on. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. That is what is most important about prayer and meditation, is that I have the proper attitude and I'm willing to work at it. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. Here is where the authors very clearly describe the evening review, and they give us a hint. Now remember, we are at step 11, correct? In the book, right? And then it says in the very next paragraph, when we retire at night... That's a clue. So if I'm going to retire at night, and these are the questions I'm going to ask myself in my evening review. I'm going to ask the same four questions that I ask myself as I go through the day, as I go along in step 10. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? There's a question mark. That means it's a stop sign. I'm going to stop. I'm going to answer those questions. Do we owe an apology? There's another question mark. Have we kept something to ourselves which should be discussed with another person at once? Another question mark. Were we kind and loving toward all? Another question mark. What could we have done better? Another question mark. Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Or were we thinking of what we could do for others or what we could pack into the stream of life? That does not mean do as much as you possibly can and complete as many tasks as possible. That has not been my understanding of pack as much as I can into the stream of life. What I'm hearing from that is where was I helpful? Who did I help? But we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. Here's the warning. You know, we're not here to beat ourselves up. Simply do a constructive review of my day. For that would diminish our usefulness to others. So, you see, I'm not useful to other people. I'm just simply sitting there beating myself up. I'm simply reviewing my day per these questions. Okay, here are the instructions. After I do my review, the authors are asking me to do two things in the next sentence. After making our review, we ask, that sounds like a prayer, doesn't it? We ask God's forgiveness. In other words, you know, um, yeah, I was thinking mostly of myself today. God, please forgive me for doing so. No, I wasn't kind and loving towards all. Please forgive me. And then, and then there's that word and, and which means in addition to. That means I'm going to do something in addition to prayer. Inquire what corrective measures should be taken. So if I'm going to inquire what corrective measures should be taken, that implies I'm going to listen. In other words, after I do my evening review, I'm going to pray and meditate. We talked about that last week. How central it is for me to meditate in addition to pray. You see, if all I'm doing is praying, I'm not completing step 11 in its entirety. Notice the wording of step 11. Sought through, it doesn't say sought through prayer to improve my conscious contact. So you see, if all I'm doing is praying and not meditating, am I going to improve my relationship with God? Am I going to receive the knowledge of His will and the power to carry it out? 
My experience has been no. If my friend Scott here calls me up and invites me to his house for a party, and I hang up the phone before I can receive directions, I'm not going to know which way to go to get there. That's what prayer without meditation is like. I've created a lot of unmanageability in my life and sobriety as a result of not meditating on something, but rather praying. I had made decisions based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. That's how essential it is for me to practice daily meditation. So isn't this beautiful? They're giving us a specific outline of how to do evening review, and they're giving me instructions to pray and meditate when I finish my evening review. Next paragraph. They show us how to do morning meditation. They give us a clue when to do it in the first two words. On awakening. On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we say a prayer. It says, we ask, there's a prayer, we ask God to direct our thinking. Especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties. Here, the authors are implying we are supposed to use our brains. Employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is clear to wrong motives. After step nine, you may notice that the authors have made a shift. Four through nine is about conduct. It's about where I was wrong, where I've caused harm, where I've been selfish, where I've been self-seeking, where I've been dishonest. Etc., etc. Now the authors have moved into the thought life. After all, it does say on page 23 that the main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Isn't that correct? So, what do I, what, what needs more attention? My mind. It's the main problem. So, here the authors have made a shift. Now they're shifting into let's concentrate on our thought life. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared. Of wrong motives. This helps me to address the self delusion. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here, we ask, there's another prayer God for inspiration and intuitive thought or decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. Notice that the authors are not instructing me to ask God to keep me sober. If I truly believe, if I truly conceded to my innermost self that I have no power over alcohol and there's absolutely nothing I can do to keep me sober and I'm sober and I've come to believe in a power greater than myself and I made a decision to give my life to that, what's keeping me sober? Is it me? Is it that relationship? Is it work? Maybe it's your income. That has not been my experience. So, if I've applied those principles, if I've followed that recipe in this book up to this point, and God is keeping me sober, why do I need to go to him and ask him to keep me sober? Consider this for a moment. My wife is in the kitchen and she's washing dishes. And I go in and I say, Jan, would you wash the dishes, please? (laughs) She's likely to frown at me. I'm certain she will frown. (laughs) She's going to give me that look like, I'm already doing it. Why are you asking me to do something I'm already doing? You see, I became, I fell victim to that for a long time. And the time I was bouncing in and out of these rooms. Yes, I ask God to keep me sober every day. To my knowledge, this book doesn't say anything about not drinking one day at a time. To say that I am not going to drink one day at a time implies that I still have some reservation. That has been my experience with relapse. I hear that from relapsers a lot. Yeah, I'm asking God to keep me sober day at a time. Every morning I ask him to keep me sober. Why? He's already doing it. They're instructing me to follow directions, a plan of action to direct my thinking. Let's go ahead and check that out. Let's see what the books have to say about it. Okay. Here we go. Turn to page 33. Page 33, paragraph 1, line 9. Page 33, paragraph 1, line 9. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be 
no reservation of any kind nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. No reservation. I'm going to jump ahead here just to illustrate a point. Here we go. Page 90, paragraph 3. Page 90, paragraph 3, line 6. That's line 6. Then let his family or a friend ask him if he wants to quit for good and if he would go to any extreme to do so. You see, what happened to me in that period of time that I was bouncing in and out of these rooms and couldn't stay sober was that I was not willing to quit for good. I was not willing to go to God and ask him to remove it for good. Now, to say that I'm willing to give it up for good does not imply that I have power to keep me sober. What that does imply is I'm willing to go to any length to stay sober. That means I'm going to resort to any spiritual principle I possibly can in order to not drink. Because I don't have the power to keep me sober. So that means I need to call on the power from a God of my understanding. If you're having resistance to this, I simply ask you to consider if you have had that experience. Without exception, every time I go to a meeting, go to a roundup convention, and I hear a speaker say something that I have resistance to, most of the time it is because I have not experienced it. When I heard people say things like they felt safe and protected, they were in a position of neutrality. That they stopped fighting everybody and everything. I had resistance to that. You know why? Because I never had the experience. How many people in here can tell me about bungee jumping? I have experience with bungee jumping. So what can you tell me about bungee jumping? Nothing. You have nothing to offer me about bungee jumping because you have no experience with it. You can share a lot of opinions. A lot of ideas, a lot of perceptions, but do you have any experience with it? I have some personal experience with that. I know what it's like. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> One time was enough for me, but it was a positive experience. I'm not going to go into that right now. But the point I'm trying to make, you know, in early sobriety, I found it necessary to ask God to help me stay sober because I had not had a spiritual awakening yet. I had not dialed into God's power. See, that's why it's absolutely essential that we be taken through these steps as quickly as possible. See, I'm the real alcoholic that they talk about on page 21. Given sufficient reason isn't going to keep me sober. I need to get to the power and I need to get to it now. Now. It has been my experience. You cannot take anybody through these steps too quickly. However, you can take them through too slowly. Maybe that has something to do with the decreased success rate within the rooms of our meetings. My God, how did these guys have a 75 to 93 percent success rate, especially in the Cleveland and Akron area? What were they doing that we're not doing? Give this some serious thought for a moment. Medicine has made... Major advancements since 1939, 1944. There are treatment centers. They didn't have treatment centers then. They had drying out hospitals where they detox people. Psychology has made a lot of advancements since then. And yet the success rate in AA is lower today than it was then, and they had fewer resources. But the resources that were available to the alcoholics in 1944 are the same resources that are available to us today. And it's called the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's called the spiritual principles that are contained within the first 103 pages, giving me the instructions on how to do the, the 12 steps. Before we get into uh, the promises, which is at the top of page 87, the promises of uh, prayer and meditation, I'll share with you what I, what I personally do. I don't ask God to keep me sober. He's already doing it. Keep in mind, I have to keep, I have to do my part. So basically what I do is this. I follow the instructions on this page. The first thing to do is I ask God to direct my thinking, especially that it would be divorce and self-pity, dishonest or self-seeking motives. Then I say another prayer. I ask for inspiration, a tutor thought or decision today. 
Then I ask God to help me to relax, take it easy, and not struggle. And that's when I move into my meditation for listening. And that's when I ask, what would you have me be today? Today, the, the guidance that I receive is rather simple. I typically receive guidance like, enjoy yourself today. Be kind and patient with other people. Listen. If you will practice this prayer and meditation, I can guarantee you, your life will change in a relatively short period of time. Try not to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that sobriety is solely contingent on prayer and meditation. I need to practice all the principles, not just those. But those have been very instrumental in my life. And as I stated last week, there's no right way to meditate and there's no wrong way. What you need to do is find a way that works for you. Let's look at the promises. This is what used to be the hunter of the occasional inspiration. Here they are instructing us to be patient. Gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Once again, notice the authors are putting emphasis on the thought life. Being still in experience and having just made conscious contact with God, it is not probable that we are going to be inspired at all times. So I'm not inspired at all times. I tell myself, oh, it's not working. Remember what we read at the beginning of this. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Nevertheless, here's the thought life again. We find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration. We come to rely upon it. Isn't that beautiful? My thinking's going to change. They're telling me, be patient. I'm not going to be inspired at all times. Now I'm going to finish prayer and meditation. Then we're going to take more action. In the next paragraph, we usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer. So I'm going to pray, meditate, pray in the morning. That we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be. That we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We ask, here's a prayer, we ask especially for freedom from self-will. And we are careful to make no requests for ourselves only. We may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray if, for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that, and it doesn't work. You can easily see why. That's one of the things I love about steps 10 and 11. They guarantee that I'm going to make mistakes. That's why I need those bookends. Isn't that beautiful? i got two Two beautiful bookends. I have a bookend in the morning where I'm going to do prayer, meditation, prayer. I'm going to do a daily 10 step during the day as I go along. And at night I'm going to do evening review and then I'm going to do prayer and meditation when I finish. This has been my experience. I will only experience one of two things within the rooms of AA. I'm either getting better or I'm getting worse. There is no in between. No one, to my knowledge, has ever coasted uphill. It's real easy to spot people who are doing these disciplines. They don't take themselves so seriously. They seem to enjoy life much more fully. They laugh more. They make fun of themselves. You know why it's important for us to, to not take ourselves seriously? Because we are the joke. We are it. We are the joke. That's why I can't take myself seriously. Another reason is you're not going to. <laughs> okay, basically this is what the early AA members did. Be aware that in the 40s, the early AA members, especially in the Cleveland and Akron area, did what they called daily written meditation. They did it daily. They prayed and they meditated. After meditating, they pulled out pencil and paper and wrote down all the guidance that they received. No editing. Write it all down. And then they took those thoughts, that guidance, and they tested it against the four absolutes. See, if it's honest, pure, loving, and unselfish, I can be assured that it came from God. Keeping in mind that not everything I hear in meditation comes from God. 
So what this process will do for you is it will clearly identify the origin of your guidance. So they would take the four absolutes and test it against the guidance. This way they could be assured which guidance came from God and which came from them. Here are some examples on this, on this piece of paper, on this handout. Let's assume that this is the guidance you received in your meditation. Give them a piece of my mind. Is that honest, pure, loving, and unselfish? No, that came from me. Next one, be patient with others today. Is that honest, pure, loving, and unselfish? Yes, that came from God. I need to avoid that person today. Is that honest, pure, loving, and unselfish? No. Be kind to others today. Is that honest, pure, loving, and unselfish? Yes, that came from God. Accept others as they are. Is that honest, pure, loving, and unselfish? Yes. So here we can be assured which guidance came from me and which came from God. This is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to do it just for one week. Try it for one week. Meditate after you pray. That means listen. All the guidance that comes to you, write it down on paper. Test the guidance against the four absolutes. Come back next week. And though I understand this is a private matter, personal to you in your, in your two-way communication with God, I'm going to ask that you come back next week and be willing to share with us the guidance that you received from God, not the guidance you received from you. So what you do is you test it against the four absolutes, cross off the guidance that came from you. The purpose of doing this is to show you that God does exist and that he does communicate to us during meditation. Those of you that are willing to complete this exercise will be a great example to those in this room that are still doubtful that God communicates to us through meditation. There are a lot of books out there that you can read on meditation. There's one book I would recommend that you get for meditation. And it's a book that has the word meditation in it. If it says meditation, get it. If you don't have information on meditation, it's information that you don't have. There's no right way, there's no wrong way to do this. You have to find a way that works for you. What I did in the beginning was I used the serenity prayer for a period of time. I used the 12 steps. In other words, I would recite all 12 steps in my head so I could get quiet. You can try using breathing exercises or simply focusing on your breathing. Go through a process where you're relaxing the entire body. You know, where you're starting at the top of your head and you're telling yourself, I'm okay, I'm going to relax my head, my neck, my shoulders, my chest, my stomach, etc., etc. Whatever works for you. Personally, I like to have a quiet place. When I do my meditation, I go a place where there's no phones and there's no TV and there's no one knocking on the door. And I go through my prayers and I go through this process of attempting to become quiet and still. In the beginning, it was real difficult. There was a lot of chatter going on in my head. The worst thing we can do during meditation is trying to stop it. Let it happen. Don't try to control the chatter in your head. During the week, I asked you to uh, consider doing the uh, written meditation exercise where you write down the guidance that you received during meditation and then test it against the four absolutes. I'm asking for any volunteers, anybody who would be willing to share the guidance that they received this week. I understand that this is a personal matter in two-way communication with the God of your understanding. I'm hoping those of you that did do it would be willing to come forward and share with us the guidance you receive from God in order to show yourself and other people that guidance does come during meditation. Do I have any volunteers? Come on up. <laughs>